lecture today. Um, thank you so much for coming. My name is Sarah Ripp. I'm the Academic Services and Programming Manager for Lossies. Um, just a couple of announcements. On the back corner here, we have a, um, a sign-in sheet which we'll pass around, which we really appreciate you writing your name on. We need that for the accounting for lunch. Um, also, um, a pe couple people asked me if you're supposed to save or recycle the utensils and plates. They are recyclable, so we'll make sure that we bring out the, the plastic recycling bin so you guys can hopefully put your stuff in there afterwards. And I'll turn it over to Katya Bellin, our faculty director. So thanks again for coming. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Katya Bellin, I'm the faculty director of LASIS. It's great to have you here at our second talk uh, in the series of race and indigeneity studies. And that is going to be offered by Grant Armstrong, Associate Professor of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, specializing in linguistics, and in particular, syntax, morphology, and semantics. And luckily for us, also in uh, Yucatec Maya. So some time ago, in uh, uh, some work and social circumstances, Glenn told me about uh, a new project he was starting in Guadalupe, Victoria. In somewhere in the middle of nowhere between uh, Guatemalan border, Tapachula, about uh, which we heard just a week ago, um, and the uh, Mayan Lacandon region. So I was uh, very excited and asked uh, Grant to come here and Tell us about everything he discovered there. And uh, interestingly, I just asked uh, uh, Grant how far was Guadalupe Victoria from Tapachula. And we looked at the map and we thought, well, by bus, it would be really very hard to get there, probably. It would take the whole day. But straight line, it's just probably between 100 and 200 miles, no more than that. And you remember last week, uh, uh, Cassie Lourdes said that in her book about the uh, growth of economy in southern Mexico, she did not have the word indigenous because people did not identify in that way. So here, just 100 miles, so maybe 150 miles north, and uh, we uh, have a lecture that fits perfectly to raise an indigenous studies series, and we are going to be talking about uh, Mayan Yakalteco uh, language. Uh, so just before I pass uh, the word to Grant, I just wanted to remind you that on the 5th of November, we have the third lecture in the series of race and indigeneity um, that is going to be about Colombia and the perception of territory by a national park uh, workers as opposed to indigenous, indigenous people who uh, inhabit that uh, territory. And that's going to be very interesting because uh, as a person who works for Humboldt Institute, uh, dealing with national parks and indigenous people will be uh, visiting medicine to, uh, to talk to us about that. OK, without further ado, I am passing the word to Grant. Uh, please welcome. Uh, for our, uh, talk. I'd like to say thanks to Kata and Alberto for inviting me to give the talk. I want to preface the talk by saying that I'm basically going to be talking about how the idea came about. Um, I've only done a preliminary trip there, and so what I'm going to present is my proposal that I'm using to try to get money to actually do the research. So um, hopefully that happens. Um, and I'm going to talk mainly about three things. I'm going to give a general overview first of Pacalteco Popti um, and its speakers. Um, and then I'll kind of discuss what I would traditionally do as a linguist to try to get data um, with any language. Um, but, and then I'm going to mention uh, kind of the changing value systems in, in linguistics in general that are attempting to incorporate um, indigenous worldviews and knowledge into creating data that is more accessible and useful to people outside of academia. Um, and then I'll discuss the preliminary plan I have to, to do something that bridges those two worlds. 
um, in Guadalupe, Victoria. Um, so we'll start with uh, Hakalteco or Popti. You see that I, I used a hyphenated name. Um, the, it is one of about 30 Mayan languages that are spoken primarily in the Chiapas state, Yucatan, and Guatemala. Um, and it's a member of the branch called the Canjobalan branch. It's spoken, I will see a map in a minute, um, basically in the northeastern region of, of Guatemala, princi principally. Um, and the language has two names, basically, because Jacalteco refers to the main area in Guatemala where it's spoken, the region of Jacaltenango. Um, and since the Guatemalan Civil War, um, there's been a, a Mayanist linguistic movement to try to change the name of the language because that language was imposed by Ladinos who basically labeled any speaker of that language must be from that region when in reality not everyone is from Jacaltenango that speaks the language. Um, so there's evidence that the pre-Columbian name of the language was Popti. Pop is petate, that's the sitting or sleeping mat, and ti is mouth. And so many speakers prefer that language name, and it's also the preferred name uh, used by the Academia de Lenguas Mayas de Guatemala. Um, in Guadalupe, Victoria, all the speakers that I was able to consult with, they prefer to call themselves Jacaltecos, and they speak Jacalteco. But I'll use the hyphenated name to be as inclusive as possible. Um, so uh, mainly when people think of this particular language, they think of a, a particular region in, in Guatemala, which is uh, a particular section of the Department of Huehuetenango, which is that border region right here. I'm gonna zoom into the different uh, municipios. Um, this is the Jacaltenango municipio, Santa Ana Vista. There's a couple other municipios where this is spoken. Um, census data puts the number at around between 30 and 40,000 speakers. Um, and the sociolinguistic situation is typical of, of an indigenous language um, in Latin America where the vast majority of those speakers are, are bilingual. There may be a few elderly monolinguals in, in certain areas, um, mainly rural areas. Um, what's interesting in the, the context of Guatemala is that there are a number of institutions that are dedicated solely to promoting, preserving, and basically maintaining these languages. One of them is the Academia de Lenguas Mayas de Guatemala. Um, if anyone wants that information, you can access their website. Um, the Academia has branches for each of the languages spoken in Guatemala, and they're all in charge of they have a standardized writing system that's used across the Mayan languages. Um, they promote literature uh, and, and basically use of everyday language in all types of contexts, not just the traditional type of rural context, um, writing, etc. Um, and that's, that's unique in, in, in the indigenous world. In addition to that, there is a group of native speaker linguists called Okma in Guatemala. Most of these have these people have been trained by in the US or Europe and have gone back to their communities and done you know, linguistic work on dialectology, um, morphology, syntax, semantics. And this is really part of uh, a Mayanist linguistic movement that has defined uh, what linguistics is in Guatemala. Um, and so that there, even though the situation for most indigenous languages is bleak, um, the context of Guatemala is, it's not as bleak it is, as it is in, in other places because of, of these institutions. Um, so as is the case with a number of indigenous languages, not only in Latin America, but also um, some in the US um, and, and Canada, where the, the language themselves, are, they're not defined necessarily by national borders, right? We have examples uh, like Yaqui in, in Arizona and Mexico, so many Mayan languages are also spoken uh, that, are, that are considered Guatemalan are also spoken in Mexico. Um, the primary reason for that was the Guatemalan Civil War, which there were many refugees that, that fled Guatemala and then just remained in Mexico. Um, so speakers of Cachiquel, Quiche, Mam, etc. Um, now, the particular case I'm going to talk about is this language is not defined by national boundaries either. 
Um, however, Guadalupe Victoria, and so this is a, a picture from the balcony of my hosts. Um, this is the border crossing La Mesilla, um, and then through those hills, if you drive about two hours, you get to Jacaltenango, right? Um, and so Guadalupe Victoria has uh, a really interesting history um, that I will not be able to get into in detail. I'm going to give you another map so we can like see more or less where it is. Um, I, I was talking to Kata earlier about this. So we were here before, right in that, that region, that's Huehuetenango. Um, and then this is Chiapas State. These are the municipios of Chiapas State. The, the municipio where Guadalupe Victoria is, is Amantenango de la Frontera. It's about right there. Um, you can get there from the major cities, Tuxla and uh, San Cristobal de las Casas. It takes about five hours by bus um, to get there. And this is the distance from kind of the cultural and linguistic heart of Jacalteco speaking Guatemala, right? It's, it's again about two hours away. Um, so the, unlike other communities that came from Guatemala, Guadalupe Victoria, the, the community of speakers has been there for about 120, 130 years. They came prior to the Mexican Revolution they actually arrived in Chiapas um, right about when the state was purchased by Mexico from Guatemala, right? So anybody that knows anything, Chiapas linguistically is more Central American than the rest of Mexico. They have both and they use all kinds of expressions that are not typical of, of Mexican Spanish because it was part of Guatemala. Um, and so they got there and they, they established themselves in that particular area and they've maintained their cultural identity as Jacaltecos for the past 130 years. And so, and as a linguist, that's interesting because we want to see, has their language changed in a way that's different from, you know, the people that uh, have remained in, in Guatemala? That was one of the things that drew me to the community, in addition to the fact that I, I know somebody who, who is from there. Um, so I'll just mention a couple of the, the cultural traditions that they've maintained. Um, uh, one would be um, coffee. Um, so that region of Guatemala is coffee country. Um, and the story is that they, they decided to establish themselves in this particular region of Mexico because it was conducive to growing the same type of coffee bean, that uh, Arabica bean that they had in Guatemala. So. This is, um, this, the, the land itself was given to the people as an ejido, um, and this is a picture from inside the, the Comisaria Ejidal. Um, this is where Guadalupe Victoria is, and then surrounding the actual town is arable land and all of its coffee. Um, so this is, you know, a coffee plant that's, you know, they're going to harvest. This was taken in July. That will be harvested in, in December or January. And these are my hosts, Meyer and Don Jesus, and they're, they're kind of uh, cleaning out the area where they're going to be harvesting the coffee um, later. And so that, that's one cultural tradition that's essentially, um, that's the same um, as, as what you would find in, in Jacalteco speaking uh, Guatemala. Um, the others, religious iconography and ceremonies, um, they've the same type of religious syncretism that exists in that region of Guatemala also exists in Mexico. Um, they're, they, 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 the La Virgen de la Candelaria is their patron saint, which is something they've, they've brought with them. They also have the custom of um, putting crosses at the entrance to the town. Usually you would go down into the valley um, all the roads that are in the hills going down into the valley have a cross on them and they are like uh, religious uh, ceremonial centers. Um, and that's also typical of the region where they, they originally came from. Um, so they are culturally Jacaltecos and they consider themselves as such, right? Um, now, the, the linguistic question, which is what I, I'm, I'm mainly interested in, though not solely, um, is, is much different, right? So in Guatemala, um, we have around 30,000 speakers, which are, is relatively few compared to other Mayan languages in the country. Um, so the census data that we have available puts the total number of speakers of Jacalteco in Mexico, that's usually all in Chiapas state, at around 500, right? And that includes speakers that probably came over um, later after, during the Civil War. 
Um, the number that are currently living in Guadalupe Victoria, I think I trust this number more because this was done by a real door-to-door -door census by my, my co-worker, Don Baltasar, when he, he wrote a dictionary and he went to, to all the houses in the town and actually counted. He estimates that many of those people have since died. So we're looking probably at around, you know, 300 speakers left in the town. All the speakers are older. There's no younger speakers. As far as I was able to gauge, they would be the second and third generation of the original founders of the town, which was founded in, in the late 20s. Um, and the, the use of Jacalteco is very limited. It's not something, if people have traveled to Mexico, um, if you've gone to San Cristobal, for instance, you hear Tzotzil everywhere. I mean, people are speaking it all over. If you get on a bus, you're going to hear it, right? And it's not like that with, with Jacalteco. Um, it's because not, no young people speak it. Um, it's limited to certain areas. There's one uh, older man who teaches uh, children when they have resources in the school. Um, and then it's used in religious ceremonies and also one of the things I found um, that was most common, I talked to a couple musicians, people still sing uh, marimba music in Jacalteco. And I think that, again, is a tradition that's been brought with them uh, when they, they came over from Guatemala. Um, so this obviously is a situation where the language is, is likely to, to not be spoken anymore in one or two generations because there just are not any speakers younger than, than 20. Um, so as, as a linguist, obviously we, we want to study these languages, do anything we can to help uh, preserve them. Um, and so I'm going to try to just take you through like what I, I plan to do and also I, I think it's sort of personal for me because I my thoughts about what I wanted to do sort of changed as I as I was talking to people um, and so I can say that when I first got there I was really interested I, I work on like technical aspects of language and I want to know about the sound system and the, the structure of the words and the structure of the sentences um, and for me uh, what I knew about Jacalteco before had to do with grammar and sound system. So I'm just going to give you a, a taste of that, that kind of thing. Like, um, as linguists, we want to know, we want to study these languages because of what they can offer us as far as the nature of human language in general. If we were to only study the national languages of Europe, uh, we really wouldn't have a very diverse picture of what um, the possibilities of human language are. So I'll just give you one example from the Mayan languages um, has to do with sound systems um, and the way that certain consonants are contrasted with one another. Um, English and Spanish, we typically use uh, the vibration of the vocal cords to contrast consonants like pa and ba. So we have words like pat and bat. We can hear that difference and it's just a pure vibration of the vocal cords. Mayan languages sometimes have the ba, ga sounds, but they're all from borrowed words from Spanish, right? Um, instead, they make a distinction which involves the tensing and raising of the larynx and then uh, a quick release of the air. So we'll hear these, um, but this would be something like the Spanish ca, ca, and this one is going to be ca, no, okay, right? And th that distinction exists throughout the language family. Um, and just so you can hear it, I'll, I'll play these. Um, and I think the, the main point here is as, as linguists, we get a, a more diverse picture and well, we, we can actually study that diversity by going into languages that are, are not our typical national European languages. So um, that's one, one case where the, the, the role that indigenous languages play in our, our understanding of human languages is key, right? Um, another, I'll just give you one more example. Um, all Mayan languages are verb initial languages. So this means that in a, 
the neutral word order, if you had a subject, a verb, and an object, would typically involve the verb first, and then some order of object and subject following the verb. Um, but there's differences within the family about what the, the neutral order is. In, in Hakalteco, or Popti, um, we get the verb first. This is the verb for hug. This is the girl, and this is uh, a woman. So that these are glosses here, and then this, this kind of tells us what all the morphemes are, and then this is just the translation of that sentence. And these are, these are taken from, from a, a previous work on the language. Um, this particular example, this is the verb eat. That is uh, the mountain lion. That is the tortilla. So that would be the mountain lion ate the tortilla. So it's kind of a humorous example. I'll, I'll talk a minute about like the, this, uh, that, that kind of data elicitation. Um, but I, the, only, the reason why I, wanna, I wanted to highlight this is because um, in the, the way that our theory of language has evolved over the years, um, initially when modern you know, linguistics and syntax in particular was in its infancy, um, the, the work was mainly concentrated on English and other European languages. And uh, we had inherited from you know, the Greeks this idea of the subject and the predicate, and that's what the sentence is, right? And in English, it's reflected in the linear order. Um, and the way that we can connect the two, theoretically, it lends itself to this you know, geometry where we can just take the subject and the predicate and link them together in a tree form. That's kind of what, what syntacticians do. Um, in these types of languages, not only Mayan languages, but other languages that <laughs> exhibit this word order, um, they represented a, a kind of conundrum for linguistic theory because the subject is actually in between parts of the predicate, right? We have the verb and the object here and the subject. And th what do we do with those? And for some time, they were sort of exceptional, yet they've played one of the most crucial roles in sort of redefining what a sentence actually is theoretically. And so without this type of data, we, we would probably have a, a, a flawed notion of what like a basic sentence is. Um, and so then th those have also played a crucial role. Um, so that's kind of how I was approaching the whole project uh, at first. And before I get into other questions that I think are kind of more relevant to what we saw previous in the previous panel. Um, the, the way, a question that I think is, is important, not only for non-linguists, but also for linguists, is how, how do we get the data that we get um, in order to make these claims about the languages we're working on? Um, and so if we were working on sounds, we would record, and then we would analyze the recordings and then see how we can describe those particular sounds. If we're working on uh, you know, word order um, and basic word order, I'll just give you an example of what the linguist might have done in order to get at this. They might record something, they might see an example in some monologue, and then they might go and test, like, how do I know that that is the basic word order and there's not some kind of emphasis going on? So what uh, we would typically do is we'd have to engineer a context and then ask the speaker about, in this particular context, what would be the most natural way, or is it acceptable and appropriate to say each of these sentences? And then we would vary the order of the sentences and ask the speaker, in each case, is this acceptable and appropriate, etc. So for this particular example, the mountain lion ate the tortilla, so you would, you would have to explain to the speaker in Spanish or in Jacalteco, you come into your house and see the tortilla you made earlier is missing and ask what happened indicate whether each of the following phrases would be important to answer that question. You may try to do it orally, you may try to use written if the person can read, and then you would go through each of these and probably <coughs> determine that this would be the, base, the most natural basic way to say it, whereas these others would typically involve some type of emphasis and they would be inappropriate in this particular context, right? Um, so this would be a, a kind of traditional way to elicit data that then you could later use to say, well, based on this, I, I can claim that the, the word order in this language would be verb, subject, and then object, right? Um, and so again, that's, that's kind of how I'm approaching this project as I get to Guadalupe Victoria, right? Um, and, and so now I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put up a couple questions with respect to this. So uh, as a linguist, I think, 
a lot of the times we we do things in the name of science, right? And so our our motivation and and the validation of our work is because we're furthering science, we're furthering our knowledge of, of human language, right? Um, and this helps us get a better picture of how all languages work, what they have in common, where they're different, etc. Right? Um, and so it's it's within that particular context that I think there's there's a couple of of points that we need to address and. Um, any of this literature that anyone's interested in, I'll, I'll be glad to um, uh, look, get, send it to you. So the first is the impact of that research. That is, um, who, who stands to benefit from that, right? From, I mean, furthering science, who, who benefits from that? Um, and there, there is probably one of the most, it, 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 is, it, it is, as an academic, reading this paper really makes you question what you're doing. Honestly, like this was a, a Mayan linguist who wrote this paper and basically just destroyed what linguists were doing in the country um, because of the way they were doing it. So, you know, what is the benefit of that research, you know, for us? That, that would be one question. Um, the next is context. Unlike English and other national languages, w most of these languages are either extinct or endangered, right? So we is it responsible to simply study the languages for scientific purposes or do linguists have, I'm just going to read what's up there, have a responsibility to address and even reverse the historical, social, and cultural factors that contribute to language endangerment and death? Again, another uh, seminal series of articles in, in the major linguistics journal language um, can be found on that topic. And then um, the the method, right? So we looked at the method. Typically, traditional linguistic methodology involves separating language from culture, right? And I, I think saying that might be jarring to some people because most people have this idea that they, you can't really separate the two. But that is what traditional linguistic uh, methodology is. It kind of s takes language out of its cultural context and tries to get at the, the nitty gritty details of these technical aspects of language. Um, and in doing so, we often create these like silly looking examples like the mountain lion ate the tortilla. And it seems fine, but when you're working with a language where maybe the only thing that the person knows about the language is some silly example like the mountain lion ate the tortilla, it paints the language in kind of this silly way that might not be welcomed by the speakers of the language. It also um, it separates the language from cultural context, and, and it might be hard for speakers to even understand what are you even doing? Like, what am I even doing here? I don't really even understand what the point of doing this is. That would make the data suspect one, and it also is kind of disrespectful to the speaker themselves to force them to do this thing that they're, they're not even, they don't, they might not understand. So these are all issues that have come up in, in this particular context. I can tell you that I, for one, I believe in, in both of these things. And I, and I think that you know, searching for a way to, to do research that, that can advance you know, both the, the, the traditional Western academic scientific ideas and also these is, is sort of what we should strive for. Um, and so one, uh, a, a newer subdiscipline of linguistics um, called language documentation does try to, to strive to do this. It's not really resolving the problem, but it, it, it's at least addressing the issues that have been raised by speaker communities. And typically what you'll see um, in this research are um, proposals that try to document languages um, in their cultural context and try to make contributions that um, are they, they are consistent with the values in kind of the academic world of linguists, but also uh, respect the, the values of, of indigenous communities. So I'll just talk briefly about what some of these projects look like. Um, I'll, I think I'll have time to show you just an example of some of the stuff that, that's out there. Um, and so we'll start with um, the, the types of things that are valued in a language documentation plan that are a little bit different from, you know, a traditional academic view. Um, 
in the humanities and, and, and social sciences, we often think like the most valuable thing is like this theoretical book or article about something. That's like, that's what research is. Like you have to produce this, this thing that, that is theoretical in nature. Um, and one of the things that this particular subdiscipline is trying to get at is that um, it's the data itself 